Income Tax 2023-2024. Maker's Depreciation. How is the depreciation deduction figured? Part number three. Get ready and some coffee. Stay alert so that income tax preparation doesn't become too taxing. Most of this. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Noting that the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income, here having income minus deductions resulting in taxable income. The Schedule C sole proprietorship form flowing into line one income of the formula, the Schedule C itself basically an income statement. Having business income minus business expenses, which could also be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls in from the Schedule C to line one of the income tax formula, the formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040, this being the first page of the Form 1040, the Schedule C rolling into line eight, ultimately, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, Schedule C rolling into line three, in, uh, business income or loss. And then we have the Schedule C, profit or loss, from business having a PL profit and loss or income statement format income minus expenses where the expenses are our point of focus it usually having the most categories or most items within it some expenses being more confusing than others such as depreciation where as we've seen in prior presentation even if using a cash based system we're forced by the tax code to do some accrual things such as putting depreciable property on the books as an asset even though we don't have a balance sheet but rather possibly having depreciation schedules acting as a partial balance sheet, giving us the asset accounts of fixed assets, property, plant, and equipment, and the contra asset account of accumulated depreciation and also calculating the expense for the period, the depreciation expense, remembering that we can think of depreciation for taxes as having a component stolen from similar to complying with or having the logic of the generally accepted accounting principles or just accrual accounting that being the makers part that we're looking at here which we would expect to be more consistent as time passes and then having those parts that don't conform such as the 179 deduction and special depreciation which we would expect to fluctuate with uh, different you know, lawmakers and different situations that they are responding to all right in prior presentations we discussed the maker's depreciation in terms of the normal calculation using tables to do the calculation over the life of the property and then we talked about some situations where we dispose of the property and now we're going to be continuing on with examples from this point in time so a quick little example before we get into this example if i bought like a ten thousand piece of equipment then the IRS is not going to let me just expense it as equipment expense, but rather put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it. If I put it on the books as an asset, I might be able to get a 179 deduction and special depreciation, which we talked about before. But right now we're talking about the makers, which is what would be left if you, if you, after you took the 179 or special depreciation in essence, 
which we would then have to determine using the method that the tax code allows us to apply, which oftentimes is a form of double declining balance with a convention such as a half year type of convention. Now that convention often confuses things when we put this thing on the books because then I have a partial year that I have to account for because I bought it in the middle of the year or sometime during the year. It also causes a problem when I dispose of the equipment, which is something that we also talked about. So if the equipment was fully depreciated, disposing of it is pretty simple of a calculation because I can take it off the books without really having an impact on the Schedule C because the, the asset account and the contra asset account will basically cancel each other out. I still want to make sure I take them off the books so that I don't have a complex depreciation schedule that doesn't tie into what's what I actually have in my business, but it's not going to give me something possibly, possibly nothing on the actual tax return in terms of an impact on the tax calculation. But if there's still stuff that needs to be depreciated, I need to figure the depreciation for the last year of disposition, possibly having to take into account the convention, such as half year or mid month, and so on and so forth. And then I'll have to calculate whether I have a gain or loss on the sale at that time based on the remaining basis and the sales price in, in essence. All right, let's look at this example. You use the calendar year and place non-residential real property in service in August. The property is in service for full months, September, October, November, and December. Your new, uh, numerator is 4.5 for full months plus 0.5. We're using a half year, or I mean, sorry, a mid-month convention here. So you multiply the depreciation for the full year by 4.5 twelfths of or that's going to be the 0.375. So if I sold the property, because the property is real estate, it has a mid-month convention, and therefore I have to figure basically the fraction using a mid-month, which came out to 4.5 .5 over 12, 12 being 12 months in a year. All right, examples. The following examples show how to figure depreciation under makers without using the percentage tables. Figures are rounded for purposes of the examples. Assume for all the examples that you use a calendar year as your, as your tax year. Now remember, tax software is going to be the easy thing to use typically, and it will typically use tables. It's useful, however, to figure the calculation possibly without tables, because then you get a conceptual understanding of it and can at least give the general principles to somebody as well as be able to view and double check, deconstruct these calculations of the software and make sure that the data input has been done properly. So example one, 200% DB, double declining basically method and a half year convention, meaning no matter when we purchased it, we assume we purchased it in the middle of the year, making the calculation easy as well as in the middle of the year on the last year or year of disposal typically. So in February, you placed in service depreciable property with a five year recovery period and a basis of uh, $1,000 you do not elect to take the one the section 179 deduction and the property does not qualify for special depreciation allowance. So in other words, I bought the $1,000 piece of equipment. I would like to expense it up front. The government won't let me do that because it's property, plants, and equipment that should be depreciated. So I put it on the books as a depreciable asset. We need, I put it on the depreciation schedule. I still can probably take it all in depreciation in the form of 179 deduction, but that's not our point of focus right now. So we're gonna say that we're not taking the 179 deduction. Remember, that's the one that's gonna fluctuate over time. And we're gonna be thinking about that $1,000 with regards to maker's uh, depreciation. We're saying it's five uh, year property and therefore has a depreciable life, you would think of the five years. You use GDS and the 200% DB method to figure your depreciation. So when the SL straight line method results in an equal or larger deduction, you switch to straight line. Now notice if you're using tax software, you're not actually going to switch like the data input from double declining to straight line. You're just going to choose the applicable method and the software will apply the calculation, which will basically be makers double declining you know, method. But under that method, it switches to straight line at the end 
or the final parts of the years in order to get it to work out properly, basically, is the general idea. You did not place any property in service in the last three months of the year, so you must use the half-year convention, which is generally beneficial because we get more of the depreciation up front. It's only if we purchased a bunch of the equipment at the end of the year where the IRS would force us to go from the more beneficial half-year convention, usually more beneficial, to the less beneficial mid-quarter convention. All right, first year. You figure the depreciation rate under the 200% uh, DB double declining method by dividing uh, to 200% by five, the number of years of uh, the recovery period. So if I was to, if I was to, you can do this a couple different ways, right? I could say, okay, it's two over five. That would be the rate. You can think of it as the straight line, which would be one over five. That would be the 2% uh, times two to double the straight line rate. That would also get you to that double declining uh, rate. You can also think of it as, well, if I had property of 1,000 and I'm gonna depreciate it over five years, that would be 200 a year divided by the 1,000. That gives me, uh, once again, my straight line rate times two. So there's just a couple ways to think about how to get to that rate. So the result is 40%. You multiply the adjusted basis of the property, 1,000, by the 40% double declining rate. You apply the half-year convention by dividing the result, 400 by 2, depreciating for the first year under the 200% double declining 200. So now you have your 40% times, times the 1,000 is going to give you 400. Note that gives you, uh, and, th that, and then I divide that by 2. Sorry, divided by 2 gives you the 200. Note that that 200 is the same as the straight line calculation, 1,000 divided by five, right? But it's it's different because th this is for a full year under straight line and it's equivalent to a half year, half year convention, you know, double declining. So it looks the same in the first year, but will not be the same in the second year common mistake uh, to make is to think that you have a straight line calculation there, even though you're using a double declining half year convention. So you figure the depreciation rate under the straight line method by dividing one by five, the number of years and the recovery period, the result is 20%. You multiply the adjusted basis of the property 1000 by 20%, which is the straight line rate SL rate, you apply the half year convention by dividing the result uh, result 200 by two depreciation for the first year under straight line is only 100. So, right, it's 100 because you would get to that same 200, but then the half year convention would divide it by two to get to the 100. The uh, DB method provides a larger deduction. So you deduct the 200 figure under the 200%. That's why the default is usually double declining for this three, five, and seven year. It's more beneficial because we get to get a higher deduction. So that's what most taxpayers would pick anyways. Second year. So you reduce the adjusted basis 1,000 by the depreci depreciation claimed in the first year 200. So in other words, the book value of the property or the value of the property, the cost or basis minus the accumulated depreciation thus far was 200 means that the adjusted basis is now 800. So you multiply the result 800 by the double declining rate times 0.4, and that's going to give us 320. So depreciation for the second year is 200 or a percent of that or 320. You figure the straight line rate by dividing one by 4.5, the number of years remaining in the recovery period based on the half year convention, you used only half a year of the recovery period in the first year, you multiply the, the uh, reduced adjusted basis 800 by the result of 22.22%. Depreciation under the straight line method for the second year is $178, noting that that straight line calculation might not be the way you would intuitively think of a straight line calculation, which might be more like taking the cost $1,000 divided by the number of years, five, you would expect $200 each year for a straight line calculation, except for the first year of purchase and the last year due to those partial years in the first and last years. But this method is basically being used as part of the double declining balance calculation because as part of the double declining balance calculation, we've got to figure 
when the double declining calculation is going to be less than the straight line calculation because that's the point we switch over to the straight line calculation which is confusion and something that you don't actually calculate most of the time because software will help you with those calculations and or of course you could be using the tables but we want to intuitively basically understand that we're getting a front-loaded amount of depreciation and this is the technical calculation helping us to depreciate more up front than in the latter years so the db method provides a larger deduction so you deduct 320 figured under the 200 percent db method in the third year you reduce the adjusted basis 800 by the depreciation claimed in the second year 320 you multiply the result 480 by the db rate so now we have the 800 before right because we have the one thousand dollars minus uh the 200 depreciation we took uh in the first year and by the depreciation claimed and now we took another 320 in the second year that means our adjusted basis is basically this 480 which we once again will multiply by the double declining rate 0.4 which is going to give us that 192. so depreciation for the third third year under the 200 percent db method is 192 you select the straight line you figure the straight line depreciation by dividing one by the three five three point five you multiply the reduced adjusted basis for 80 by the result uh 28.57 depreciation under the straight line method for the third year is 137 the db method provides a larger deduction so you deduct the 192 figure under the 200 percent so once again the, this one is higher than this one so we're taking uh the higher uh the higher one again so fourth year you reduce the adjusted basis 480 by the depreciation claimed in the third year so now we, we have the next year so we were at the adjusted basis of 480 minus the 192 that was taken adjusted basis that has not yet consumed the potential energy the deduction still there is 288 so multiply the result uh, by the double declining rate 40 percent depreciation for the fourth year under the double uh, declining method is 115. you figure the straight line depreciation rate by dividing one by 2.5 you multiply the reduced adjusted basis 288 by the result 40 percent uh, depreciation under straight line method for the fourth year is 115. The straight line method provides an equal deduction so you switch to the straight line method and deduct the 115. so now you're in the same spot so so that so there's always going to be this overlap uh where you were getting more deduction from the double declining and when it gets even or the straight line gives you a bigger deduction that's when we switch to the straight line method you can see this is kind of an ugly method to use but it's it's the method that was picked to try to get that accelerated depreciation in the first years uh fifth uh fifth year so you reduce the adjusted basis uh 288 by the depreciation claimed in the fourth year 115 to get the reduced adjusted basis so that's the amount that has not yet been consumed the potential energy potential deduction you figure the straight line depreciation rate by dividing one by 1.5 notice we're not doing the double declining thing anymore because we already switched now to the straight line so the so you multiply the reduced adjusted basis 173 by the result 66.67 depreciation under the straight line method for the fifth year and that is 115 the sixth year now you might be asking how is there a sixth year I thought it was only five year property but if it's five year property you'll recall that we're gonna have a half year in the first year and a half year in the last year therefore it's spanning over six years two of those years being partial years the first and the last all right so you reduce the adjusted basis 173 by the depreciation claimed in the fifth year 115 to get the reduced adjusted basis of 58 there is less than one year remaining in the recovery period so the straight line depreciation rate for the sixth year is 100 percent so notice again we had to kind of fudge the cal calculation because it's not a perfect calculation that's just how the double declining method works so you can see how kind of messy this is actually 
right? You do the double declining method until the straight line method actually deducts more than the double declining method. Then you switch to the straight line method, which is kind of a strange straight line method that they're using to kind of coincide with a double declining. And then in the last year, you're just going to finish it out depreciating the rest of it because you're in the last year, basically. And that's just the way it works. So you multiply the reduced adjusted basis 58 by 100% to arrive at the depreciation deduction for the sixth year. Now this complicated kind of calculation gives the rationale or kind of tells you why the tables do not calculate exactly uh, oftentimes what you would get if you did this manual calculation because it's, it's pretty messy. So if you're trying to create tables that do this calculation easily, they're going to do some rounding and whatnot that's probably going to take place, which is why when you use the tables, you might come up with a number slightly different than if you did this manual calculation. That's what tables are usually what's going to be used in the accounting software, you would think. Example two, straight line method and mid-month convention. So in January, you bought and placed and serviced a building for $100,000 that is non-residential real property with a recovery period of 39 years. So when we buy real property, then it's going to be depreciated over a long time, in this case, 39 years, because it's a non-residential. Uh, and we're going to be using a mid-month convention, typically, with that property and straight line as opposed to double declining. So the adjusted basis of the building is its cost of $100,000. You use GDS, the SL or straight line method, and the mid-month convention as opposed to the half-year convention or mid-quarter to figure your depreciation. So first year, you figure the straight line depreciation rate for the building by dividing one by 39 years. The result is 0 0.02564. The depreciation for the full year is 2,564. So again, you might think of that intuitively and remember that we're not including land as part of the depreciable part of the building, just the building. So 100,000, you might think I'll just divide that by 39, right? Which would, which would give you that 2564. That would be the normal thing to do. If I divide that by the 100,000, that gives me the rate, which is that 0 0.02564, which I could also get by just taking one divided by the number of years, 39, gives me that rate which I can then multiply times the cost of the building, 100,000, and that's gonna give us the 2564. Under the mid-month convention, you treat the property as placed in service in the middle of January, because we bought it uh, in January. So instead of the full year, we assume we bought it in the middle of the year. So that means that we have 11.5 months, right? So of the year depreciation, Express as a decimal the fraction 11.5 months divided by 12. So I'm going to say I bought it in the middle of the January. Therefore, I can depreciate it for 12 minus 0.5, right? 11.5 months uh, of the year. So I can then take that divided by 12. That's going to be the fraction of the year that we can take times the calculation that we just got to up here, which is the 2564 is going to give us that uh, 2,456 uh, 2004 about, there's rounding, uh, there's rounding involved. Rounding is involved here, okay. All right, let's look at the second year. So you subtract uh, 2,456 from 100,000 to get your adjusted basis, 97,544 for the second year, the straight line rate is 0.0. Uh, 269, uh, uh, 2629. So you would think that you could take the 100,000 divided by the 39, which would give you the uh, 2,564, which again is usually the most intuitive way to think about a straight line rate. And you would think that that would be the depreciation for every year, except for the first year and basically the last year. And if I took that rate uh, d divided by uh, divided by the 100,000, then we, we get back to that uh, 0.0264 that we saw basically back here. So now we're going to take then, uh, we can also think about it as this way. We're going to take then this amount of, what did I come up to? I said 100,000 uh, divided by 39 years is the 2564. Uh, 
And so if I take that divided by then this adjusted basis we still have left, 97544, we get to this 0 0.02, uh, 0.2629 about, right? But I think intuitively, most people kind of think of the straight line as basically just taking the 100,000 and then divided by the number of years. That would be every year except for the first and last year is kind of the easiest way to just intuitively think about it. So, so, this, so this is one divided by the remaining uh, recovery period of 38.042 years. That's 39 years reduced by the 11.5 months or the point uh, nine five eight. So in other words, we had it for 39 years and we have 11.5 uh, months that we are uh, reducing it by. So if we took the 11.5 over 12, then we get the point uh, nine five eight about, and that's where that number is coming from. So we're taking the one divided by the 38 now, uh, point oh four two. So and that's what we're getting this rate by. Okay, so your depreciation for the building for the second year is 2,564, which again is basically the same as just taking 100,000 divided by 39, which is the 2,564. Uh, All right, let's do the third year. So the adjusted basis is uh, uh, 94,980 because it was before the 97,544 after one year of the partial year of depreciation minus the 2,564. Uh, so this would be the book value in essence that we have left, meaning the cost minus the depreciation that has been taken thus far. The straight line rate is 0 0.027, which is uh, one divided by the 37. 042 remaining years your depreciation for the third year is that 2564 which again should come out to basically just 100,000 divided by 39 it's going to give us that 2564 okay so then we have the example 3 200% double de double declining balance method and mid quarter convention all right so during the year you bought and placed in service in your business the following items. So items, you have a safe uh, in January for 4,000, office furniture September for 1,000, and a computer in October for $5,000. So you do not elect a section 179 deduction. So we're going to take that off the table for now and just focus on makers. Uh, if you did have a 179, you would take that first, of course, and then use the adjusted basis after that to then figure the makers in essence. So, and these items do not qualify for the special depreciation, same idea. So you use GDS and the 200% double declining method to figure the depreciation, which is the default method for that kind of property typically. So we didn't elect out of it. We didn't elect a straight line. We want the standard double declining because that's usually the most beneficial because we get more depreciation up front. So the total basis of all property you placed in service this year is $10,000. The basis of the computer, 5,000, is more than 40% of the total basis of all property placed in service during the year, 10,000. So now, in other words, all this property would typically be, now remember, if you could get the 179, it would you could or the special you would have a substantial upfront depreciation but we've removed that and then we would have a half year convention assuming that we purchased all the stuff in the middle of the year except that we had a large amount of the purchases happening at the end of the year in which case the irs thinks possibly we're abusing the mid-year convention and therefore is forcing us to go from the more favorable mid-year convention because we would get more depreciation in the first year under that convention to the less favorable mid-quarter convention, which again, software is quite helpful to help us with these calculations, but understanding it intuitively for planning is useful and to de deconstruct to see that the data input has been input properly. So, so, so you must use the mid-quarter convention. So this convention applies to all three items. So the safe and office furniture are seven-year property and the computer is five-year property. So first and second year depreciation for the safe. The 200% DB rate for seven-year property is 0 0.28571. You determine, uh, you determine this by dividing two, 200% by seven. So same kind of concept here. We could say, all right, 
it's instead of one over seven, it's two over seven. Or you can say, well, what if it was one over seven? That would be the straight line times two. That's where you're gonna get uh, that rate. If you took the actual property, you could say, well, it was a $4,000 thing uh, divided by seven. That would be the straight line amount of, of depreciation divided by the 4,000. That would be the rate times two. So this is just a few ways that you can get to basically that same uh, rate. So uh, da, 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 the depreciation for the safe full year is 4,000 times that rate. Okay, you place the safe in service in the first quarter uh, of your tax year. So you multiply the 1,143 by 87.5, the mid quarter percent for the first year. They pulled this from the table that we saw before for the mid uh, quarter. So it's because you're assuming that you bought it in the middle you know, of the quarter. So the result, 1,000, uh, the result, 1,000 is your deduction for depreciation on the safe for the first year. That came out nice and uh, round. <laughs> for the second uh, year, the adjusted basis of the safe is 3,000. You figure this by subtracting the first year's depreciation, 1,000, from the basis of the safe, 4,000. Your depreciation deduction for the second year uh, is the 857, the 3,000 times the point. 28571 and we don't have to deal with that mid quarter convention in the second year. So first and second year depreciation for the furniture. The furniture is also seven year property so you use the same 200% DB rate double declining in essence balance rate of 0.28571 you multiply the basis of the furniture which was $1000 by the 0.28571 to get the depreciation of 286 if it was for a full year however you place the furniture in service in the third quarter of the tax year so you multiply the 286 by the 37.5% which you get from the mid quarter percent of the table the result is $107, uh, your deduction for the depreciation on the furniture for the first year. For the second year, the adjusted basis of the furniture is $893. You figure this by subtracting the first year's depreciation of $107 from the basis of the furniture, $1,000. Your depreciation for the second year, $255, which is that $893 times the point. 28571. You don't have to worry about the mid year month convention or mid quarter convention for that year. First and second year depreciation for the computer, finally. The 200% DB rate for five year property is 40%. How do we get that? Well, you can take uh, two divided by the five years, 40%, or you can calculate the straight line, one over five which would be 20 times two to double it for double the double rate. Or you can take the actual cost of the thing, which was 5,000 divided by five. That's how much you would deduct in essence under a straight line divided by the cost of 5,000. That would be the straight line rate times two to double it. There's your 40%, just a couple ways uh, to see that. So you determine this by dividing two by five, the depreciation for the computer for a full year is 2,000, 5,000 times 0.4. You place the computer in service in the fourth quarter of your tax year. So you multiply the 2,000 by 12.5%, the mid quarter percent for the fourth quarter. The result 250 is your deduction for depreciation on the computer for the first year. For the second year, the adjusted basis of the computer is 4,750. You figure this by subtracting the first year depreciation, 250 from the basis of the computer, which you bought for $5,000. Your depreciation deduction for the second year is $1,900, which is the 4,750 times the 0.4. All right, example four. 200% double declining balance method and half year uh, convention. So now we're in the normal kind of half year convention. So last year in July, you bought and placed in service in your business a new item of seven year property. So that's fairly common type of property, seven year. This was the only item of property you placed in service last year. So the property cost $39,000 and you 
elected a 24,000 section 179 deduction. So now we're adding the complexity of the 179 deduction. So we didn't buy it in the last quarter, so we don't have to move from the more favorable uh, half year convention to the mid quarter convention. But now we're going to say that we are taking advantage of some of that 179 deduction, allowing us the upfront deduction, which we have to adjust the basis for before we can get to the makers part of the calculation. So you also made an election under section 168 K7 not to deduct the special depreciation allowance for the seven year property placed in service last year. So the general rule of order we might say is we have the piece of property. Do I want to elect all or part of it to be subject to 179 deduction, which means we can basically expense it utilizing it possibly all of it up front. We made the election this time for the 24,000 uh, in this case, and then the special depreciation for the amount remaining might also still allow us another upfront depreciation, possibly up to like 80% of the remaining amount possibly, uh, but we can elect not to, to do that. So we're saying we're not going to do the special depreciation so that now we can get down to the maker's component for the amount of the depreciation basis that's still left. So because you did not place any property in service in the last three months of your tax year, you used the half year convention. You figure your deduction using the percent tables uh, A1 for seven year property. The last year, your depreciation was 2,144, 15,000 times 14.29.1429. So in July of this year, your property was, was vandalized. Oh no. So you had a deductible casualty loss of $3,000. So now we're adding in again that and the next kind of complex component where we had we had this casualty loss uh, and that could have an impact then on the basis calculation, which is going to mess us up. So in other words, we were using the tables, which was the easy way to do it. But then because of this casualty loss thing, it's going to mess up our basis. So we can't use the tables properly anymore. It might have to do an actual physical calculation in that case. So you spent $3,500 to put the property back uh, in operational order. So it was vandalized. We had to get the graffiti off it. Those punk kids, dang it, stealing stuff, vandalizing things. It's ridiculous. Anyways, whatever. What are you going to do? Your adjusted basis at the end of this year is 13356 So you figured this by first subtracting the first year's depreciation, 2,144 and the casualty loss $3,000 from the unadjusted basis of 15,000 to, uh, to this amount 9,856 you then added the 3,500 repair costs. Okay, so let's think that through we bought it for 39,000. So we bought it for 39,000. We deducted upfront 179 deduction of 24,000 leaving us with a basis of the 15,000. Of that, we deducted using normal maker's depreciation, the 2,144. So minus the 2,144, that's going to get us to the 12,856. So that's where our adjusted basis was. And then it says that we had the, the uh, you had a deductible casualty loss of $300. And then you spent 3,500 to put the property back in order. Your adjusted basis is that uh, you figured this by taking, we subtracted out the 2,144 and the casualty loss 300 from the adjust 3,000 minus the 3,000, the casualty loss, because we basically consumed that casualty loss, not in the form of, you know, we got the tax benefit from the casualty loss. So there's an interplay between it and the adjusted basis. And then uh, to this amount, uh, you you then added the 3,500 repairs. So we're going to put back into it to get it back to where we wanted it to be, our property, 3,500. So now we're at then the adjusted basis of the 13,356. Great, no problem. Except now the tables no longer work because now we've messed up our basis calculation and the tax tables uh, might not be appropriate for us to do the calculations going forward. So you cannot use the table percentages to figure your depreciation for this property for this year because of the because of the adjustments to basis. You must figure the, de the deduction yourself. You determine the DB rate 
by dividing 2, 200% by 7. The result is 0.28571 or 28.571%. You multiply the adjusted basis of your property, 13,356, by the DB rate of 0.28571 to get your depreciation deduction of 3816 for this year. So that's somewhat of an unusual situation. I won't spend too much more time. Figuring the deduction for property acquired in a non-taxable exchange. So this often happens in like real estate. And again, it's one of those calculations that actually is a, is a fairly complex and I can spend like a whole, spend a whole course on, on like kind exchanges, for example, but we get the idea of this interplay between uh, the basis and the consumption you know, of, of the basis, uh, uh, in, in which allows us to take some of that. The question is, do we get some of the benefit of the deduction sooner rather than later kind of thing? So if your property has a carryover basis because you acquired it in a non-taxable transfer, such as a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion, you must generally figure depreciation for the property as uh, if the transfer had not occurred. However, see like-kind exchanges and involuntary conversions earlier in Chapter 3 under how much can you deduct and property acquired in a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion. Okay. Property acquired in a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion, you must generally depreciate the carryover basis of the property acquired in a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion over the remaining recovery period of the property exchanged or involuntarily converted. You also generally continue to use the same depreciation method and convention used for the exchange or involuntary conversion. So the general idea of a like-kind exchange is, is basically saying, well, if I had this large piece of equipment, for example, or like a building, for example, uh, if, if I was to, to, to sell it and purchase some, another building then, or something like that, then I might be subject to having uh, a gain that I would have to basically pay taxes on, which would be a tax triggering event, which would decrease the likelihood for those transactions to take place, which might suppress transactions in the economy. So, so, so the idea would be, well, if you're, if you're going to be in the same spot afterwards, then, then we can basically adjust the basis, keeping in essence, like the basis the same, uh, and, and that will allow us to more easily do exchanges possibly, which might be more beneficial for the economy overall because it won't result in people having to re record the sale of the property when they're not actually selling the property in order to realize the gain and get the cash. They're trying to, they're trying to basically get in the same position and transfer or trade uh, the property. But it gets complex because of course, usually when you have like a like kind exchange, you're not just exchanging one for one. There might be cash that's going to be involved as well, which means there could be adjustments to basis and whatnot. But again, that's a whole nother course in and of itself. So I don't want to go into too much detail. So this applies only to acquired property with the same or shorter recovery period and the same or more accelerated depreciation method than the property exchanged or involuntary converted. The excess basis, the part of the acquired property basis that exceeds its carryover basis, if any, of the acquired property is treated as newly placed in service property. For acquired property that has a longer recovery period or less accelerated depreciation method than the exchange or involuntarily converted property, you must generally depreciate the carryover basis of the acquired property as if it were placed in service in the same tax year as the exchanged or involuntarily converted property. You also generally continue to use the longer recovery period and less accelerated depreciation method of the acquired property. So if the maker's property you acquired in the exchange or involuntary conversion is qualified property discussed earlier in chapter three under what is qualified property, you can claim a special depreciation allowance on the carryover. Special rules apply to vehicles acquired in uh, a trade-in. So 
for information on how to figure depreciation for a vehicle acquired in a trade-in that is subject to the passenger automobiles limits. See deductions for passenger uh, automobile acquired in trade-in under do the passenger automobiles uh, limits apply. That's in chapter five. Caution. Like-kind exchanges completed after December 31st, 2017 are generally limited to exchanges of real property not held primarily uh, for sale.